Well, good evening, Wednesday nighters. It's good to have you with us tonight. Chance to worship the Lord, get in the Word. So welcome. Um, we're going to sing some worship songs and get things rolling. Why don't you jump in with us? Lord, we thank you for this time tonight. Chance to worship your name, give you glory. We invite you into this place tonight, into the houses, cars, lawns, wherever people are. Lord, I pray that they find your, your presence, your joy, your love. We just pray your blessing on this evening. In Jesus' name. you are in this place, wherever we are, Lord, that you tell us that you are the one who dwells in the temple of our hearts, Lord, and your Holy Spirit is there. And so we pray that you just fill our lives with your presence, Lord. Even as we sing these songs, we want to make a throne where you're seated upon, Lord, as you say you inhabit the, the presence of your people, you inhabit the praises of the people, and, and you're enthroned upon the praises. Lord, that's what we want tonight. This comes from Psalm chapter 27, verse 1 and 2. Yeah. 
shall I fear, oh Blessed is he whose sins are forgiven. Blessed is he whose sins are no more. Blessed is he whose hate is forgotten. Blessed is he whose spirit. Blessed is he whose sins are forgiven. Blessed is he whose sins are no more. Blessed is he whose hate is forgotten. Blessed is he whose spirit.
thank you so much for your word that tonight we get to open it and look to the scriptures for wisdom and direction. And I pray that like Psalm chapter one, we'd be like that tree that's firmly planted. And I will delight in the law of the Lord. I will meditate day and night. And then like a tree firmly planted, I'll be grounded in your word. Blessed is the one who follows the way of the Lord. Blessed is the one. So tonight, Lord, bless this time. Speak to us by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good to sing with you and good to have you this evening. I'm going to be um, getting into Isaiah chapter 41 tonight. So why don't you grab your Bible and turn to Isaiah 41 and we'll get to it. I noticed tonight there's getting more and more cars out in the parking lot on these Wednesday nights, they're right up there. And they're just kind of hanging out, doing the online thing. I think that's kind of cool. Uh, folks just want to be here. Hi, guys, I can see some of you right now through the window. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of cool. Um, and man, stay tuned. I really am praying, and so are the governing elders and our leadership. We've been praying on our knees very much about, well, through this whole thing, quite frankly, and fasting and praying. Just, just to say, Lord, what would you have us to do uh, as far as gathering? So stay tuned. We're, we're still praying about this. And there, there's just, you know, one of the key scriptures we've been in uh, is uh, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and, and be still before the Lord. And the Lord has definitely given us that message thus far, which it kind of goes counterintuitive to who I am personally uh, I just have to say, uh, I'm not the person that does well sitting still. Um, I like to do stuff, and uh, I'm not a great rule follower, I just have to say. But I do love the scriptures, and I love following the scriptures. And, and if you're ever going to follow some rules, that's, that's, where we're, that's what we're doing. And so right now, we've been seeking the Lord, and he's telling us to be still. But stay tuned, you know, the Lord could kind of redirect us. And I do sense in, in some ways that that's, that's coming, so... Just keep, keep us in prayer, and uh, we just want to do what the, wills, the, the will of the Lord is. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, Isaiah chapter 41 is where we are in our study. I uh, love just verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, right through the scriptures. That's what we're doing. And uh, we looked at um, chapter 40 last week, and we ended on that most classic and powerful scripture, Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. Wow, that's powerful stuff. And we've been kind of meditating and mulling over that one. Before we leave that, because it really is, we're going to pick right, right up, you know, where, where he left off in chapter 41. We're going to pick it up in 40, uh, 40 and 41, kind of, you almost don't even want to break those two chapters apart because they're very linked. Uh, you'll see what I mean here in a second. But before we leave that verse in, in chapter 13, uh, chapter 40, verse 31. Um, and did you notice the order? Um, you got your flying, you got your running, and you got your walking. Um, they that wait upon their Lord shall renew their strength. And I, I've often meditated on that verse, just thinking, what, what, wonder why the Lord puts it in that order. It almost seems a little bit backwards. They that wait upon the Lord shall walk. And then, the, then after they walk, then they'll run. And then after they'll run, then they'll fly. Why does the Lord put this backward? Well, um, it's, it's not backward because it's the scripture, so we know it's correct. So why would the Lord do that? And I have a theory that I want to run by him, and that is I've found in this life that um, everything's backward. Pretty much everything you and I think about, it's opposite of the way the Lord sees it or thinks about it. And, uh, and I've just found that the scriptures oftentimes rub us the wrong way, seem to go contrary to our society and our culture. In fact, it just seems sometimes that the word um, just gets it wrong. And so people think it's wrong, but I think it's right. And we're the ones who've wrong. Remember, we study the Bible, not judging the Bible. We let the Bible judge us. So this verse, is it backwards? No. And here's my theory. I wonder if 
The flying part's the easy part. You know, flying is hard, easy because once you're up there, you're soaring. And you know, you and I, we've, we've lived lives of soaring. We've, we've flown, man. That's the easy part. When you're on the great days and you're having great victories and everything's on top, you're on top of the world. Man, those are the easy days when things are easy. But some of them is a little more of a, of a race. You know, you're running the race, running the race. Like Paul said, run the race to win the prize. And that's a little harder in some ways than just soaring up in the heavenlies. That's the easy one. But then, then the Lord takes it to the next level. But if you run and, and not grow weary, man, that, that's the thing right there. That, man, that sometimes takes a little more work, the, the race that, that we want to run to win. But I would suggest even harder still sometimes is the walking. Just the daily grind, day in, day out, walking through this life. The soaring when you're having great victories, easy peasy. But when you're walking on the days of COVID and you're locked down or, you're, or your you know, financial portfolio is struggling or your business is tanking or you're feeling alone or you're feeling depressed, it's that daily walk that can be so cumbersome and difficult. And I wonder if that's what the Lord's saying. Hey, they that wait upon the Lord, seek him, pray to him, be patient for him to move in his time and his plan. They that wait upon the Lord, he will then renew their strength. They'll mount up wings like easy, easy, easy peasy. They'll run, that's competition, it's hard to race. And then they'll walk and not faint. That's, that's the one that, man, that's the, the, the main thing right there. It's just that steady walk. You know, the word walk implies steady progress. You know, the walk of life as we just walk day in. Running is a short sprint or, or race, but it's not, it's not so daily. Walking is something you gotta do. Um, and I think that that's the thing that Enoch was so commended by the Lord. Remember Enoch? Bible doesn't say much about him, but he was a great man and he walked with God and he pleased God. Those were the two things that were said, you know, autobiographically about Enoch. He did those two things. He walked with God and he pleased God. So remember the Lord took him up if you would, sort of raptured him before the flood of Noah, uh, which is a great story. But, but I, I think that's what the Lord wants from you and from me is, is uh, you know, the flying part, yeah, it's easy. The running, it's impressive and race, but the walk, that's where you gotta really clamp down and say, Lord, help me get through this walk of this life. So, so that's the way Isaiah is sort of challenging the people of Israel during those most difficult days of Isaiah, Hezekiah, uh, the Assyrians, the new up-and-comers, the Babylonians. All of this is, is the word of the Lord to the people, and it, it fits our time perfectly. So then he picks up right where we left off there in verse 1 of chapter 41. It says, Keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near and let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment. Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to foot, uh, to his foot, gave the nations before him and made him rule over kings. He gave them as the dust to his sword and as driven stubble to his bow. So he, he jumps on this whole be still, uh, you know, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So he says, keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let the people renew their strength. Now, the, the thing is, those that keep silence before me, that's, that's when we're not chirping and chattering and, you know, um, posting and sharing and liking on social media. Uh, sometimes I think we need to be silent. I think there needs to be a lot more silence uh, in the Christian church today where we're quiet and slow to speak. Uh, there's too much chatter, uh, whether it's from, you know, just your average person or pastors or whatever. Sometimes I, I, I worry that we're, we're chattering just a little too much. And, um, and sometimes we're supposed to keep silence. Now, when it says here the islands, we'll be talking about, you know, Maui and Kauai and, uh, you know, the big island. What are we talking about? The islands here. Well, the word the islands is a tough one sort of for scholars to sort of nail down what it actually means. Some, some translations put it the coasts, the various coasts of the various nations. Um, in fact, most scholarship sort of agrees that I've looked at uh, it, it basically says that, um, you know, you can read it, keep silence for free, O oh, nations. The islands are talking about perhaps even the continents, giant islands, we call them continents. But in this context, the nations and the, and the continents, the world, the nations of the world. And by the way, when you're reading through the Bible, when it talks about the islands, many times it's talking about the nations. So that's a little key 
in understanding Bible stuff, especially when it comes to Bible prophecy. Uh, whenever we're talking about future and the world events and geopolitics and all that, when the Bible deals with politics and, and the future and the end times, when it talks about the islands um, and even the, the, even the seas, uh, the, the, the seas uh, can be the nations uh, in biblical typology. So kind of keep that tucked away when you're reading through the Bible because it could read, keep silence before me, O nations, and let the people renew their strength. Now, now, what we understand here is this is starting to set sort of a scene of this massive courtroom. Um, it's almost like when it says, keep silence before me, O nations, or let the people re uh, renew their strength. It's almost like the judge in a courtroom, you know, is slamming his gavel saying, order in the court. And um, silence, you know, keep silence or, or you know, you're going to be taken out kind of a thing. That's the idea of this sort of courtroom. Um, uh, a challenge really to the nations uh, because they're going to be judged. And uh, the Lord is sending someone who's raised up a righteous man from the east. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Um, who is this righteous man raised up in chapter 41, verse 2? Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, made him rule over kings. We're talking about somebody who's pretty impressive. Now, some of you might say, well, this is Jesus. Because Jesus is always the answer, right? Uh, and, um, and I wouldn't say that you're wrong. Remember uh, that uh, Isaiah tends to deal with sort of a dual level or a dual fulfillment of prophecy. There was a, a near prophecy to Isaiah's time, but it would also be superimposed over a far prophecy in future, even in our future time. So s some people say, well, this is the future, the far future prophecy is when Christ returns. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will rule over kings. As it says here, he made him rule over kings, gave him as dust to his sword and driven stubble to his bow. That does describe what Revelation 19 tells us when Christ returns as not a carpenter, but as a conqueror, not as one to be judged by the world, but the judge of the world, the second coming of Christ. And so we can see that sort of mentioned here and brought up this idea of, um, of Christ and his second coming. We'll see that in this chapter. But the near prophecy is fairly certain as well. We know who this, this one that the Lord is raising up, and he's gonna be talking about this individual quite a bit in the next several chapters. And the Lord's gonna even give us his name before, you know, long before he would ever be born. This is one of the great things of the book of the Bible uh, of prophecy when you're talking about biblical prophecy is you, if you take an honest look at the Bible, God knows the beginning from the end. He knows the future. Um, he knows what's going to happen. And this is per perhaps one of the greatest. Now, remember when I tell you about the Deutero-Isaiah theory, where there's two Isaiahs, one was much later, one was much earlier. One of the main reasons the uh, so-called theologians, the cardigan-wearing, pipe-puffing college professors that are on Discover Channel and the guys that really don't know the Bible... Um, they're actually saying, well, it has to be a Deutero Isaiah or a second Isaiah. And this is one of the reasons about the thing we're about to dive in right here. The, the Lord naming a guy hundreds of years before he actually comes onto the scene. Here, Isaiah the prophet is gonna name who this king is uh, and, and, uh, and what's the deal with this guy. Um, in fact, uh, 150 years after Isaiah gives this prophecy, uh, let me just tell you, just give you a sneak preview. It's coming in the next week or so. Um, Isaiah says, he that saith to the deep, be dry, and I will dry the rivers. That saith Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform my pleasure. Verse 1 of chapter 45, thus saith the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings. I will open the gates before him. You guys that know your book of Daniel know this. Um, but it says uh, in verse three, and I will give thee the treasures of darkness, hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which called thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. This is what the Lord says. I know who this guy is that's coming 150 years from the time of this prophecy, a guy by the name of Cyrus. And the Lord says, I have named you before you were even born. So the critic of Isaiah says, well, there's no way Isaiah could have known the name of Cyrus the Great coming from the Medo-Persian Empire, you know, 150 years after this was supposed to have happened. So rather than believing the miraculous nature of biblical prophecy, and rather than believing that God could name some dude to Isaiah and have him write his name down 150 years earlier, 
You either believe God did that or you don't. And the Deutero Isaiah people say, well, see, it's a second Isaiah. Much long, years after Cyrus came, he sort of wrote it in uh, and said, Cyrus, you know, you're, I've named you and all this, sort of like uh, pretending that it was a prophecy. The Bible doesn't pretend. The Bible is miraculous. I do not believe the Deutero Isaiah theory, and I think it's a theory that sort of um, undermines just the miraculous nature of the Bible. Um, and, uh, and they also do that not only with Isaiah, but perhaps they even target Daniel, the book of Daniel, even more. Because Daniel not only names, you know, like, uh, like Cyrus here is named, but Daniel says, okay, after the Babylonians, the Medo-Persian Empire is going to come. And after the Medo-Persians, then Alexander the Great. And uh, he all but names Alexander, you know, like um, a guy, a priest by the name of Jadutha came out when Alexander was getting ready to sack Jerusalem. Jaduthan comes out and says, do you know that you're in the holy scriptures of the, of the Jews? And they showed him the book of Daniel, how the one who would come after the Medo, Medo-Persian empire would come. And so moved was, was Alexander, he didn't conquer Jerusalem. He, uh, it, it was a, sort of a peaceful sort of taking because of this whole thing that he saw his name in the Bible. Like it's an amazing story, but this is God who, who knows the beginning from the end. And he's able to predict the future. now. Because of these things that he so perfectly predicts, we should also know that all the future events that that he's yet to show us, we can bank on those things. They're gonna come to pass, and they are coming to pass right before our very eyes. We've got another prophecy update coming up uh, here on August, I think it's August 7th. The, the, you know, our first Fridays kind of thing of August, we're gonna be doing that on the 7th this, this month. Um, and, uh, and I've got a bunch to say about the Middle East, Israel. Um, uh, you know, we, we've kind of got our eye off the, the epicenter of prophecy, which is Jerusalem, uh, because of so many other things going on around the world that are biblically foretold. But uh, well, hopefully we'll focus a little bit more on that. I, wanna, I got a lot of stuff I wanna talk about there. But that's what's so great about the Bible. It's full of these truths that only confirm the validity of the Bible. When you see uh, that prophetically it's, it's 100% accurate. Um, other books have tried, by the way, everybody's marveling right now because George Orwell's 1984, some of the stuff we're seeing unfold right now uh, here in 2020, we're seeing, we're very much like the big brother and the, the, the stuff that you read about in, um, in George Orwell's 1984. But did you know that Orwell, even at this point, he's got it 35% accurate uh, with his book in 1984. Uh, And that's impressive. You gotta give the guy credit. But was he inspired by the Holy Spirit? No, had he had been, he would have been 100% accurate uh, in writing about what would 1984 look like. Um, And he was 35%, kudos to him. The Bible's 1,000, batting 1,000. You know, it's like 100% accurate. That's the Bible. So all that to say, this is speaking of, in a foreshadow kind of way, uh, of Cyrus the Great here in, in chapter 41. And he will drive them into the dust, uh, driven stubble to his bow. Like he's gonna come uh, with great might, um, the prophecy concerning Cyrus. We'll get more into that here in a week or two uh, when we get to chapter 44. Uh, so he goes on in verse three. He pursued them and passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? If the Lord, the first with the last, uh, pardon me, I the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. The Lord is saying, Cyrus is gonna do it, but I'm the one who's equipping him, preparing him, sending him. He's gonna go away that he had never gone before, and I'm gonna be the one to do it. Um, now, this is great because, um, um, you know, God's saying, I'm gonna be sort of behind Cyrus and I'm gonna strengthen him. Um, and who has done this? He says, I, the Lord, uh, uh, which is the first and with the last, I am he. What is this phrase that we read about throughout the Bible that the Lord is the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end? What's this whole thing? Well, it, it's, it's the, the idea of the exclusivity of God. I hope you understand that when he says the first, the last, it's, it's not that he's saying it's two. It's, it's almost like if you have a line and there's, a, there's one person and the person's at the first of the line and also at the last of the line, then what do you have? You don't really have a line. You've just got the person who's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Um, and it's, there's only one is kind of the idea. 
There is no other that came before him. There's no one who will come after him. There's a very exclusive claim to that person who would say, I'm the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And all throughout the scriptures, the Lord says this of himself. There is only one God. Now, this gets really interesting because there's actually, let's just make this kind of confusing for a second. There's actually two first and the last, Alpha and Omegas, beginnings and the ends, theoretically. Two, are you kidding, Brett? The Bible says there's only one and the Lord is, is the one. Well, flip, keep your finger here and flip over to Revelation chapter one with me real quick. I wanna show you something you can show your Mormon friends or your Jehovah's Witness friends, people that don't believe that Jesus is God, uh, which is an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. If you don't believe Jesus is God, you are outside of the pale of orthodoxy. That is a fancy way of saying not really a Christian church. Uh, you know, to say that Jesus is not God, you're denying that, you know, the angel says, Emmanuel, God with us, that's Jesus. Uh, you don't believe that. Uh, when Jesus said, I am my father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. And they picked up stones to throw him. The Jews said, because he makes himself e equal with God. You don't believe that either. You don't believe that Jesus was saying what the Jews thought he was saying, um, that he is equal to God. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. But one of the great places of that is this, if you can follow along with this idiom, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. If you can understand that the, the whole point of that sort of, uh, verbiage is to talk about one God exclusive. There is no other. Um, and that's where the book of Revelation chapter one gets really interesting. Now, if you read the chapter one of Revelation, you know that we're seeing very much um, uh, this great vision of John the apostle. But he says in verse uh, eight, John, John's revelation, Revelation chapter one, verse eight, he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. So this is interesting. Um, this is what you do. You show your Mormon friend uh, or your Jehovah's Witness friend this verse, verse eight, and you say, see, this, this is, this is, who is this talking here? I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. Well, they'll, they'll say, according to their doctrine, if you read the doctrines and covenants of the Mormons or the Watchtower Society of the Jehovah's Witness um, and their various goofy translations, the Book of Mormon or the New World Translation of the JWs, you, you, even, even with all that, they'll have to admit, verse eight is talking about God, the Father in heaven. There is no other, there's just God. There's one of them. And so they'll say, okay, the Alpha Omega, the beginning, the, the Lord Almighty. That, that's, that's what gets them. They have to say, there's only one Almighty. So you, you got them there saying, okay, that verse eight is talking about God. Then flip them back to the end of the book of Revelation, if you would, to chapter 22. In fact, let's flip there just now. Um, now this is, this is great because here in Revelation 22, um, Jesus starts talking here in uh, Revelation 22. Now, uh, you know, this is the end of the book of Revelation, the end of the book of the Bible. Um, talk about an important, uh, you know, passage. But starting in verse 12, um, it says, and behold, I come quickly. Now, who's saying this? Uh, you know, even, even your nominal Mormon or Jehovah's Witness will answer this correctly. Behold, I come quickly. That's Jesus. Uh, the coming of Jesus is something that, that people believe in. Uh, whether they believe he's God or not, they say, well, Jesus is gonna come. So behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. Verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments that may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates in the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, verse 16, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. Is there any question who's speaking here? First he says, behold, I come quickly. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who keep his commandments. I, Jesus, have sent my angels to testify to you these things that I'm saying, that I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I, Jesus, have sent my angels to testify these things to you. See, the problem for the JW or the Mormon, bless their hearts, is that um, Jesus is claiming to be the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and there is only one of those. You cannot 
uh, be on, honestly looking at this linguistically or scholarly, there's no way to make any argument about this, that Jesus is claiming to be God here. God claims to be the Alpha and the Omega, God the Father, and God the Son claims to be, well, Brett, that mystery just drives me, you know, this mystery of the Holy Trinity, that, that this one God and three persons. Well, yeah, even Paul said it's a great mystery. Listen to 1 Timothy three sixteen. It says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, godliness, it says God, that's, that's God the Father in heaven. God was manifest, manifest in the flesh. Who is that? Jesus, God became a man. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. Um, so you got God, the Father, which uh, was manifest in the flesh. That's Jesus, justified in the Spirit, capital S. That's the Holy Spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. What's Paul saying? He, he enumerates sort of the, the Trinity here, and he says, great is the mystery of godliness. The God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all mentioned here in 1 Timothy 3.16. Glorious, glorious truth. And so it is one God in three persons. Uh, it's, and, and you say, well, I don't get it. No big deal. If God were you know, small enough for our puny little brains to figure out, he wouldn't be big enough to worship. So I hope you can remember that. But that's where this really kind of starts is with Isaiah, this whole thing about, you know, the beginning and the end. He's, he's saying, you know, the, I am the Lord, the first and the last, I am he. So that, that's what that's all about. When you come across that in the Bible, God saying alpha, omega, beginning and the end, the first and the last, he's claiming to be one God, but it's all part of who God is in his fullness. Uh, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all in one being. Well, by the way, you know, if you, if you say, Brett, I, I don't understand that, 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 that you, you only run circles around the idea of three and one, and you know, three, three, one plus one plus one does not equal one. Yeah, but one times one times one equals one. <laughs> I'm not a great mathematician, but I do know that. Um, and and if, if it were easy to figure out, uh, then Paul wouldn't have said, great is the mystery of godliness. He wouldn't have said that. So don't be shaken by that. Basically, all the greatest scholars and thinkers have concluded, um, you know, when you read for centuries, these guys, they say it's a mystery. And we, when it gets down to it, God's just bigger than our laws of physics, time, and space. And we're all okay with that. That's who God is. Well, so this is the God that is raising up a guy named Cyrus. And further off in the future, of course, greater than Cyrus, he's gonna raise up the Messiah, the King of Kings, Jesus. <clears throat> and so it says there in um, verse five, the isles saw it. Now, what's the islands again? The nations. The nations, if you would, saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid, drew near and came. They helped everyone his neighbor and everyone said to his brother, be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith and he that smootheth with the hammer, him that smote with the anvil, saying it is ready for the, so the uh, soldering and he fastened it with nails that it should not be moved. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, who I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Okay, what's this going, what's saying here? The Lord's basically saying that the islands or the nations saw the Lord raising up this king who's coming and the nations, what did they do? They went to building idols. Verse seven is, is this group of people rushing to you know, turn these wooden shapes into golden, you know, covered statues with fastening them to stands and have, having nails and what have you. Um, and that's what the people would do. The, the people uh, that saw Cyrus coming, they would turn to their false gods. But God is saying, but you, Israel, you're different than them. Verse eight, you're my servant, Jacob, who I've chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. God chose the seed of Abraham, the Jews. Now, this is an important thing. In fact, he goes on in verse nine, check this out. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men thereof and said unto thee, thou art my servant. I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. Would you mark that in your Bible? Um, the reason this is so important is because um, this idea of casting away of the Jews did God cast the Jews away? That's what a lot of the church today believes. Replacement theology is what, you know, even 
I've noticed most churches that believe in this doctrine of replacement theology, most of the congregants, congregants don't even know they believe it. Like the Catholics. The Catholics believe in replacement theology, that God is done with the Jew. Um, they blew it. And, um, and they, uh, you know, they blew it so much that they're no longer chosen, but they're actually kind of cursed. Have you ever wondered why the Pope talks against Israel all the time and is constantly seeking to divide Israel and chop up the nation into, you know, um, you know Palestinian state? There's a reason why the, the Pope and the Catholics don't really have that. And, and a lot of the Lutherans, I'll tell you why they're the Lutherans, not all of them, but a lot of the Lutherans really think God's done with the Jews. Um, because of replacement theology. But here, the Lord's saying to the Jews, I have chosen thee. Now, on the far prophecy view here, it also says, verse nine, I have gathered thee, you know, I've taken you from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men. That's the far prophecy. What happened? Well, after AD 70, the Roman Empire, Titus the general, sacked Jerusalem. And the Jews were driven out of Jerusalem. And for almost 2,000 years, the Jews were scattered all over the earth. That's called the diaspora. And that was a fulfillment of what the Bible said over and over in the scriptures. It said, the Lord said, if you don't obey my commandments, keep my statutes and judgments, I will scatter you all over the earth. And the Lord did that for a couple thousand years. It would be May 14th, 1948, when Israel would become a nation again and the Jews would start regathering back in the 1800s. Zionism, the movement under Theodore Herzl and others, they started gathering fulfilling what the Bible says, that movement of, this, of Zionism. And by the way, you'll hear people around the world, I hate Zionism and Zionism is these, and they sort of equate it, by the way, with colonialism and some of the stuff that, you know, the way our, our country was founded, it's all put in the same category, Zion, those Zionists, you know, moving into the land of the Arab, totally wrong, not true history, fake news, fake history. The Jews were there long before any of the Arabs were there. And, uh, and, and, the, and God gave them that land, you know, back in Abraham's time. Now, then the Lord says, I, I will make with you, if you read the book of Genesis, uh, I will make an everlasting covenant with you, Abraham. Everlasting, look it up, it means everlasting, never failing, always connected. The Lord says, I will make, now there were some conditional covenants uh, with the Jews. Um, that were clear, like if you don't worship and follow, uh, follow my, my word, then I'm gonna scatter you. That was a conditional covenant. If you don't do this, then I'm gonna do that. But the idea of forsaking the Jews is not biblical. God says, I will never forsake them. Um, and um, that's an important thing. I have chosen thee and have not cast thee away. Um, I mentioned the Lutherans. One of the reasons the Lutherans tend to be an uh, replacement th theology. Um, now, by the way, this is a tough one to say because um, I remember I talked about essential doctrines of the Christian faith um, that moves a, 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 a religion in heresy as a sort of a fake religion versus, so this is, this is one of those things I almost call it an essential doctrine, but I can't. Um, what, uh, but but I, I think it's close. The, the view of what you think of Israel and the Jews, I think that's hugely important. But there are, are some of our, you know, Catholic brothers and sisters and Lutherans who love Jesus and have accepted the cross, man, they're saved. But when they get raptured, they're gonna have to change all their notes when it comes to the Jews and realize they were, they were really wrong. <laughs> um, Martin Luther, who to many of us, in some ways, we think of him as a great hero, the Reformation. Um, and, uh, and that was, and I'm so thankful for, you know, his thesis that he nailed to the Wittenberg door and all that stuff. Of course, it's an amazing part of history. But one of the things that's kind of covered up that you don't hear much about is a little book that Martin Luther wrote uh, called On the Jews and Their Lies. He wrote a book, uh, of course, in you know, his Germanic language. But in 1543, Martin Luther wrote this book in a treaty that, where he argues the Jewish synagogues and Jewish schools should be set on fire. Um, look this up. He argues that you know, um, their prayer books should be destroyed, rabbis should be forbidden to preach, homes burned, property and money confiscated. Uh, they should be shown no mercy or kindness. Um, they should be afforded no legal protection. And the Jews um, are poisonous and venom worms. And they should be drafted in, in forced labor or expelled for all time. He also seems to advocate for their murder, um, writing this. He says, we are at fault in not slaying them, speaking of the Jews. This is Martin Luther, the great reformer. Um, in the book uh, on the Jews and their lives, written in 1543, the book may have had an impact on creating sort of that um, anti-Semitic Germanic 
thought in the Middle Ages, uh, and then later showing itself again during World War II. Copies of this book, by the way, from Martin Luther, uh, you know, on the Jews and the lies, um, they actually resurfaced during the Nazi rallies. You'd see people holding this book up during the Nazi rallies, and um, the prevailing scholarly consensus uh, is that it had a significant impact on the Holocaust itself. Um, since then, the book has been denounced by many Lutheran churches, but not all. Um, so, so if you wonder why the Lutherans are total replacement theology uh, people, uh, most of them, it's because of their founder, Luther, uh, was an anti-Semite. Like, he hated the Jews. Um, by the way, if you know Luther, and I've read several, you know, autobiographies of, um, or bio, I should say biographies of Luther, Luther, and his feelings for the Jews sort of evolved over time. Um, he, he first saw the Jew as someone who needed desperately to be saved, which was accurate. But he noticed that the Jews largely didn't hear a word he said, and they really rejected his teaching. And so as time went by, he started to hate the Jew and say, they sh we should probably kill them. And that's where his anti-Semitism kind of came from. Um, if you read the book of Romans, uh, Romans 9 through 11, you realize that there, the Bible warns against the exact thing that happened to Martin Luther, that the Jews, they have this blindness and they're gonna have blindness until the end of the Gentiles time comes. And we are told not to be arrogant. Let me read you, just remind you from Romans 11, 25 through 27. You can jot that down in your notes. Romans 11, 25 through 27, it says, for I would not brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits. See, this is what happens. It's a mystery about the Jews. Don't be ignorant about the Jews because you might be conceited or arrogant about the Jews. That's what it's saying here. So don't do that, it says. It says that blindness in part has happened to Jews until the fullness of the Gentile come in. Then all of Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn ungodliness away from Jacob. When that's, when's that gonna happen? The second coming of Christ. That will turn the Jew around and the ungodliness out of Israel when Jesus comes for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Um, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. We shouldn't be surprised that many Jews look at Christians as sort of their enemy and say, what's the deal with you Christians? When we go to Israel, a lot of the Jews scratch their heads and say, why do you American Christians even care about us or like us? Um, why are you even here in Israel? And we say, well, this is where Jesus is. We try to tell them about Jesus. We show them in the Old Testament, their Hebrew Bible. Here's where you see Jesus in the Old Testament. They just, there's a blindness there. They don't see it. And they scratch their heads and say, man, we don't get it. Um, it's kind of an interesting, interesting thing. Um, I got to have dinner uh, with Yair Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu's son um, last year. And it was great. Neat guy. Enjoyed talking with him quite a while afterward. And and uh, the thing that was interesting, though, is we were talking about why America should support Israel. And I found it really interesting because he, he had all these reasons of why he thinks the American Christian church should support Israel. And, and he sort of numbered them. But, you know, the truth is uh, he just doesn't understand why American Christians support Israel. Um, it's not because they're our only friend in the Middle East, but they are. It's not because it's, um, Israel has contributed so much to the world. They have. Like all the points that Yair was making were it was totally true and right. But the reason we support Israel is because they are God's chosen people, whether they know it or not. And the Bible says, I will bless those who bless Israel. I will curse those who curse Israel. And so the, largely the, the non-replacement theology churches, and that's something that um, I think... Uh, you can see that some of the Jews scratch their heads. Why do some Christian churches hate us? And why do some Christian churches love us? They, they're confused. And the answer is simple. Anti-Semitism comes from replacement theology. It's a, it's a doctrine that has crept into much of the church. And if you're a replacement theology, you say, yeah, whatever on Israel. We don't care about the Jews anymore. But if you're a person who believes that God keeps his promises and his covenant with the Jews, um, then you, be, you become biblically right to be lovers of Israel, lovers of God's people, even though they're sinful and lost. Uh, I don't argue that Israel's doing everything right. I can't defend everything that they're doing, uh, but I can say that God loves them and cares about them. I mean, in a way, I sort of view it like um, 
picture this. If you were adopted into a family and the mother and the father loved you very much, but you also had a sibling, you know, a stepbrother who was also in the family, but you know, blood, blood relative of the mother and father, you're the adopted one. And man, you, you, you do everything right. You're the compliant child because you love the parents who adopted you. But you got that not compliant child who's the blood child and he's naughty. And he's always doing stuff that's not really great. Um, but guess what? The parents still love the, 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 the son who's naughty um, and is working with them. Uh, it's a project in, 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 the, in the making. You know, he's still got to grow up. Um, and meanwhile, the adopted son still needs to love the naughty son because there's a work in progress. You see, that's what happened to the Gentiles. We were, the Bible uses in Romans 9, 10, 11, grafted into the vine of Israel. We've been the adopted sons and daughters of God. And we are, if you would, Israel is our brother. The Jews are our brothers. Right now, blindness is in their eyes. They don't see Jesus as the Messiah. They're in rebellion, largely. But there's coming a day where their eyes will be opened and we'll all be restored. Christian and Jew and God the Father. And there's one new man, Ephesians 2, talks about how he's gonna join us all together. I hope that clears up some problems for you and it'll make sense and you'll start to hear it in your various sermons and pastors and churches when they don't ever talk about Israel. Um, if your pastor never really talks about Israel and the future of Israel, chances are you're in a replacement theology church uh, because uh, if they don't care about Israel, they're not gonna talk about it. Um, they might even say, uh, say a, a word for Palestinian statehood and stuff like that, you can guarantee that's a replacement theology kind of church. And I would say, find a better church. That's just what I would say. Uh, they may not be outside of the pale of orthodoxy, but uh, I think they're outside of good Bible teaching. I hope that's helpful. Well, uh, so this idea of, um, you know, um, of a God saying, you know, these, these Jews, I have chosen them. Um, let's go on. It says in verse uh, 10, he goes on speaking to the chosen that he's not forsaken. Uh, verse 10, fear not for I am with thee. Be not dismayed for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. We looked at this on Sunday and it applies both to the Jew locally at that time, that the Lord was gonna do that, for the Jew futuristically during the tribulation period, but also for us today. We can all, all apply and appropriate this verse. Thank the Lord, it's a great verse. Behold, verse 11, all they that were uh, incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing. And they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and thou shalt not find them. Even them that contended with thee, they that war against thee shall be as nothing as a thing of nothing or not. Um, the Lord says something here that is, should be taken note by all nations of the world. Remember, he's talking to the nations. And he's mentioning the Jews chosen, but he's also mentioned the, the nations. They're off building idols and they're all rebelling. And he's saying, if you mess with my people, Israel, you're gonna come to nothing. You will perish. Now this goes back, by the way, to Genesis 12, three, when God instituted the nation through Father Abraham, the father of the Jews. And there, in, um, you know, uh, Genesis 12, three, you know, God says to Abraham, I will bless the nations that bless thee and I will curse the nations that curse thee. One of the reasons the United States has been largely blessed is because we're one of the few nations that have somewhat stood next to and with Israel. Now, uh, this could almost become sort of conspiracy theory, but there is something that's noteworthy. Because the Bible dwells on this a lot, you know, I will bless those who bless thee, I will curse those who curse thee. Here in verse 11, all that they were incensed against thee, they shall be ashamed, confounded, they shall strive, and they shall perish. You'll never see them again, they'll come to nothing. This is a promise of the Lord. The nations that try to mess with Israel, man, they're gonna be in big trouble. And I wanna share with you something that's kinda of cool. Um, back quite a few years ago, uh, there's a guy named Bill Koen, uh, Koen, Koenig, um, K-O-E-N-I-G. He wrote a book called um, Eye to Eye, Facing the Consequences of Dividing Israel. And this guy kinda of sorta of looked at these scriptures we're talking about tonight, and, he's, and he noticed that every time a nation, people group, government did anything against Israel, especially when it comes to this 
dividing Israel, you know, separating out the, the Israel for a Palestinian statehood and all that. Whenever the United Nations did that or a country argues for that or pushes for that, cataclysmic things happen to those nations. He wrote a whole book on it. And um, I would have said, oh, that's kind of conspiracy, conspiracy theory and a little weird. But if you read the book, you might be a little bit stunned. What do all these major record setting events have in common? Listen, nine of 10 of the costliest insurance events in US history, six of seven costliest hurricanes in US history, three of the four largest tornado outbreaks in US history, nine of the top 10 natural, natural disasters according to FEMA relief costs, nine of the 10 natural disasters ranked by FEMA, two of the largest terrorism events in US history. Um, all of these catastrophes transpired um, the very same day or within 24 hours of our presidents, whether it's Bush or Clinton uh, or Bush Jr., Bush Sr., those three, just those three presidents alone, applying pressure on Israel to trade land for peace and uh, peace and security uh, meetings and making public statements pertaining to Israel's covenant land and calling for a Palestinian state. What do all these cataclysmic things have in common? All within 24 hours of, of our presidents saying, Israel needs to be divided and we need to open that up for a Palestinian statehood. All, every single time one of our presidents has made that you see, it's funny. So he wrote this book back, I think it was um, like 10, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. But if you go to Bill Koenig's, Koenig's um, website, I think it's called Watch or something, he continues to track every time our presidents say this. By the way, do you remember when uh, Netanyahu and Trump this year uh, announced their, their you know, deal of a lifetime or deal of a century uh, to basically make room for a Palestinian state? Now, I'm not sure how serious they were because they didn't come up with a plan that the Palestinians would ever accept, and I think they knew that. But what's interesting is um, when, you know, uh, you, you guess how President Trump first uh, announced his deal of, you know, deal of the century kind of thing. Um, he first announced it uh, by tweeting. I know that's a big shock. Um, but he tweeted out Tuesday, January 28th, um, um, now, or, you know, like late Tuesday, the 28th, and, and into uh, all the rest of that week. But right after Trump tweeted that, and some didn't even notice it because nobody took this deal too seriously because it's just so radically the Palestinians would say no. But Netanyahu and Trump were sort of saying, but, but let's just throw it out there. So they threw out this idea of, you know, Palestinian statehood if they meet these requirements. But what goes unnoticed is what happened within 24 hours of them making that statement. Number one, the CDC confirms first human to human transmission of coronavirus in the United States, CNBC. Second, 7.7 .7 earthquake magnitude off the coast of Jamaica felt as far away as uh, Miami, 7.7 .7 on the Richter scale. Netanyahu was, uh, they announced that same 24 hour period, three indictments filing with a court uh, gets trial moving against um, the indictments against Netanyahu uh, there in the Jerusalem Post talked about that. At the same time, the Dow Jones drops more than 500 points right after Trump tweets that and wipes out January gain as coronavirus keeps investors on edge, see MSNBC. Um, also, another just interesting little personal thing for Trump, Trump's Mar-a-Lago security breach. Remember the officials fire shots at SUV that ran checkpoints, uh, two people in custody. All of this came down within 24 hours of um, Trump and Netanyahu saying, uh, here's a plan for Palestinian statehood. Boom. That, that's just interesting. And, and what you'll find is every time somebody seeks to divide Jerusalem, because you know, the Palestinian statehood would chop Jerusalem in half. That's their goal. It would move it back to the 1967 borders when the Jordanians had sort of half of Jerusalem um, and, uh, and they're wanting to go back to that. Remember President, um, you know, um, uh, Barack Obama said, we need to get Jerusalem back to the 67 borders. And what he was saying there was basically we need to divide Jerusalem in half. 
Now, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9, one of the great prophecies on this says, it'll come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That's what the Bible says in Zechariah 12, verse 9. And you can read in Zechariah 12, Zechariah 14, how those in the last days will try to seek to divide Jerusalem in half. We're living in those days. That's why I believe we are, in fact, living in the last days um, because of what we're seeing everybody trying to do with Jerusalem. Now, Trump and Netanyahu, I don't think they really are serious about dividing Jerusalem. But, you know, the way history goes, if you're a historian, um, you know, there's a lot of the world that's saying they want to chop Jerusalem in half. But now we're sort of throwing out, well, maybe we can do this and maybe we can do that. And if you guys agree to this and that, then maybe it'll, you know, just, just the fact that we're playing around with it to me is dangerous. Um, you don't want to even joke around about stuff if you don't want it to happen. Uh, I tell couples this all the time. Don't ever let the divorce word, it's the D word in your marriage. Because what I've seen in couples is once you say, I think we need a divorce, you'll say it kind of jokingly, oh, we weren't really cut out for each other, ha ha. But pretty soon it starts to sound more serious and pretty soon you start to entertain it and then eventually engage in that behavior. That's just history. So I think that's what's happening with Jerusalem. They're talking more and more about dividing Jerusalem. Well, those that seek to do that, verse 12, they'll become nothing. The nation will become nothing. So you say, but Brett, Trump's sort of this uh, challenge because we've been so blessed economically, except for this coronavirus thing that kind of took us down. Well, isn't it interesting that when Trump, you know, was uh, making Jerusalem the capital again and acknowledging that as the capital of Israel, um, suddenly our economy is the best it's ever been in the world. And, and then um, as soon as he announces the plan of a lifetime, the economy tanks and the coronavirus hits. It's just, I don't think it's coincidence. I think we're just tracking perfectly with our treatment of Israel. Well, it goes on. Verse 13, for I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Oh man, this, we could do a Sunday service just on this verse, uh, verse 14 alone. Fear not. And he says, thou worm of Jacob. Well, that's not very nice, Pastor Brett, for God to call Jacob a worm. But you know, a worm is actually graduating up, if you ask me. You know, remember, if you remember the, the Psalm of the Lord, you know, um, the Messianic Psalm, and you remember this if, we were, if you went with us, but in Psalm 22, verse six, we have this, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The words of the cross. Psalm 22 is a Messianic Christ Jesus prophetic uh, scripture about Jesus on the cross. And remember we talked about where it says, but I am a worm, no man, and a reproach of men despised by the people. They that laugh at me, shoot their mouth at me and shake their heads saying, he trusts the Lord that he would deliver them. Let him deliver himself. See, it's all prophetic about the cross. What happened to Jesus? Why would Jesus call himself a worm? Well, the word was tolet. Remember the little worm that fastens itself to a tree and uh, gives birth to its young and then it dies on the wood of the tree, leaving a a red spot because the worm, tolet is a Hebrew word, which is where they make red dye. They squish these worms up and bright blood red color comes from this worm. And then once that worm, the, the little baby worms are born, it eats of the body of this worm that's hanging on the tree. And then, it, and then it just leaves sort of this little flaky red thing. Within a few days after the little baby worms are gone, that red spot turns into a white, bright white flake. And eventually it falls down like snow from off the tree. It's a great story and it's a great picture. Here's Jesus saying, I am the toilet, a worm. Here in Isaiah, he turns the table and says, Jacob, you're the worm. And the Hebrew word for that, toilet. You're the worm. Uh, well, Brett, what, what's the point? The point is this, God became a man. That's a massive step down. For you to become a worm, that'd be a little bit of a step down. <laughs> for you and me to become worms, yeah, step down, a little less intellectual maybe not quite as physically able, um, probably not as capable as most of us. If you turn into a worm, you'd be less effective. Um, <laughs> that's a big step down, I'll, I'll give it to you, but it's a tiny step compared to God becoming a man. So here, the Lord's saying, Jacob, you're a worm, but guess what? I'm gonna become a worm and I'm gonna die on the cross for you worms. You can make all those connections in this verse because it says, and you men, 
uh, of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy redeemer. Who's the redeemer? That's Jesus. The toleth, the Hebrew, the, the word for worm, he says he becomes a worm for their, on their behalf, and I will redeem you. The redeemer, the holy one of Israel. Now the word redeemer in the Hebrew is goel. See, I hope you're starting to make some connections here as we go through the Bible. If you've been with us since Ruth, remember the book of Ruth? We learned about the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, the near kinsman that had that responsibility to redeem. And we, what a beautiful story. If you've missed the book of Ruth, you should go back and listen to that. It's a short little book and it's a powerful teaching about our near kinsman redeemer. And all of this imagery, the worm, the toleth, the, the redeemer, the, the, the goel, it's all tucked away in this single verse. It's great stuff. All of what God does for us, beautiful. If you don't understand anything I just said about all that, it's okay, uh, but that's for the people who've gone verse by verse. You're connecting dots and you're seeing how the scarlet thread is run through the whole Bible, verse by verse, even in the Old Testament. Great stuff. Well, we got some more chapter to cover here. It's, it's verse 15. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small and shalt make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them and the wind shall carry them away and the whirlwind shall scatter them. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord and thou shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them, and I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the sheepna tree, and the myrtle, and the oil tree. And I will set in the desert the fir tree, and the pine tree, and the box tree together that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. This is the Lord saying, and remember near far, near the Lord was gonna bless the people even when they were in thirst and famine and they were in trouble. The Lord would make their lives covered and fruitful during the Assyrian conquest. But ultimately talking about the millennial kingdom when Christ will come and make this land fruitful. Um, for you botanists, there's some interesting food for thought in verse 19, these trees that are listed, many of them were never in Israel, but they would come after the Babylonian captivity. Some of the children of Israel would bring some of these trees, seedlings from Babylon over to Israel and plant them. And now to this day, you can see them uh, planted in Israel. There's one of them that was brought over that there's only one place, well, I should say two places in the world you can find this tree now, and it's the myrtle wood tree. You find it only in Israel, and there's one other place on the planet you can find it. Does anybody know where it is? Say it. Oregon. <laughs> Oregon coast. The myrtle tree or myrtle wood that we have on the Oregon coast is the same tree that's in Israel. So we're blessed as Oregonians. Uh, when you go to the coast, you see all those myrtle wood shops. You know, and that, that, that myrtle wood kind of has its special look. When you go to Jerusalem, you see this, the same myrtle wood, um, and they carve all kinds of, you know, cool stuff you know, uh, nativity scenes and cups and things that you can even use, spoons and salad, you know, spoons and bowls and stuff. They, they make all that stuff out of myrtle wood. So it's kind of cool. We go to a myrtle wood shop when we go to Jerusalem and, and uh, there's some cool stuff there. But all of this is part of the Lord's prophecy of the Bible. When you see myrtle wood, you say, wow, this is the Lord's word coming true. Well, verse 21 Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Now, this is the Lord, by the way, um, in Isaiah, speaking the word of the Lord, sarcastically. This is sarcasm, okay? Uh, I'm just giving you the heads up on this because it's a little hard to figure out unless you realize that this is the Lord saying sarcastically. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they be or we may consider them and know the latter end of them or declare us the things to come, for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter that, that ye may know that ye are gods. He's saying this sarcastically. What, do you know the beginning from the end? Do you know the future? You think you're little gods, little G here? He's saying, no, That's, it's rhetorical. And he's saying this, that you think you can pr tell the future. Only God can do that. Yea, middle of verse 23. 
Um, now I think we shift back into the not facetious, not sarcastic, verse, uh, middle of verse 23. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. Behold, you are of nothing and your work of nothing and abomination is he that chooses you. <laughs> this is the, the, the of nothing is translated, you're worse than nothing. <laughs> That's what he's saying. If you read it in the original Hebrew, it says you are worse than nothing and um, the second phrase, of not, is translated better, worse than a viper. That's what it is. So you are, you know, worse than nothing, and your work is, is worse than that of a viper. An abomination is he that chooses you. The person that chooses to go with your way, that's an abomination. You've got to go with God's way. God knows the future. You do not. Man, I think that's an important thing for people to remember. Well, verse 25, I have raised up one from the north, he shall come from the rising of the sun and he shall call upon my name and he shall come upon princes as upon mortar and as the potter treadeth the clay. Who hath declared from the beginning that we may know and before time that we may say he is righteous? Yea, there is none that showeth. Yea, there is none that declareth. Yea, there is none that heareth your words. The first shall say to Zion, behold them. And I will give to Jerusalem one that bringeth good tidings. Who's the one? Well, um, the one who brings good tidings could be, you know, John the Baptist. We talked about him last week. He was mentioned prophetically here by Isaiah. But also the angels that came and said, I bring you good tidings of great joy. There was this pronouncement of the coming, you know, uh, Emmanuel. Um, so he says, I'm going to send one to bring good tidings. Verse 28, for I beheld and there was no man even among them. And there was no counselor that when I asked of them could answer a word. Behold, they are all vanity. Their works are nothing. Their molten images are wind and confusion. The idea of idolatry is, is the way he kind of concludes this. The, he's saying, you know, I'm going to send the Messiah the one who's gonna come and do the right thing and save humanity and, and the Jews. But until then, there's all these people that are gonna to turn to other people. And he says, you, you don't have someone who's gonna tell the future. You don't have someone, all that's gonna come of nothing. Um, but you, you know, if you try to put your trust in these idols and these gods, man, it only is a bunch of wind and confusion. You know, um, this is where I think the modern Christian checks out of the Old Testament. You say, well, we don't have idols of stone and and wood and stuff. You know, um, Augustine said this about idols. Today's idols are more in the self and not on the shelf. It's true. Ashtoreth, Moloch, Baal, you know, Chemosh, um, you know, Diana, all the gods and goddesses of ancient times, they, they stood for things like sexuality, uh, for, um, you know, um, financial gain and, and uh, fertility and Things that we tend to worship, we just don't have the little stone or God of gold on our mantle. But it's, it's still alive and well, and we worship these same idols. Um, today's idols are more in the self than on the shelf. <laughs> um, trusting people or possessions or positions to do for me only what God can do, well, that's idolatry. What did I just say? Idolatry is trusting people, possessions or positions to do more for me than, than to really trust what only God can really do. Idolatry is worshiping anything that ought to be used or using anything that ought to be worshiped. Idolatry is still alive and well, and we still stupidly, foolishly um, tend to, to sort of seek after those things for blessing, for safety, for comfort, and our comfort can only really truly be found in the Lord. You know, I love this... Um, this whole thing. You know, when it talked about, um, you know, the glorious verses, you know, 15 through 20, it talked about how the Lord is the one who does all these things and, and uh, that man is nothing. We need to kind of keep this whole thing in perspective. You know, the nations of the world think of themselves more hot, highly than they ought. And this chapter reminds me that we're just little specks, that we are so tiny. Now, God cares about us and loves us, but it's when we think we're big, that's when we realize, man, we are nothing. Um, I like um, William Beebe, a naturalist, uh, used to tell this story about Teddy Roosevelt. Um, those of you guys that are like, you know, history, you know, Teddy Roosevelt was a unique guy for sure. 
At Sagamore Hill, after an evening of talking and what have you, the two would go out on the lawn and search the, the skies for a certain spot of a star like near uh, the lower left hand corner of the great square Pegasus. And they would find that spot and because they, he knew what it was. It was the Andromeda galaxy. Roosevelt knew this kind of stuff. Um, so then as they'd find it, they'd spot it. And then every night Roosevelt would, uh, would recite and he'd say, that is the spiral galaxy in Andromeda. It is as large as our Milky Way. It is 100 million galaxies. It consists of 100 billion suns, each one larger than our sun. Then Roosevelt would grin and say, now, I think we're small enough. Let's go to bed. <laughs> he, he, he saw his puniness, his tininess in light of just seeing that little spot was a galaxy that makes our galaxy look puny and tiny and insignificant. And that's kind of what this chapter's doing. That we're supposed to realize, man, we're just but dust on this earth, but God's coming and he loves us. And he's got a plan for us and for the Jews. And God's gonna do great things uh, for his people. So go with the world's way, you're gonna end up with nothing. Go with God's way, you're gonna end up on the right side of things. Pretty simple message, pretty eloquently uh, told, however, by Isaiah the prophet. And we'll take a look at chapter 42 this next week, Lord willing, and let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for your word once again. So cool, Lord, your word telling us what's gonna happen, the future. Um, we can know the beginning of the end because you know the beginning from the end and you tell us in your holy word what's gonna happen. Lord, I pray that as we look at these passages that our faith would be built, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by your word. How thankful we are, Lord. So bless the congregation tonight. I pray that they not grow weary in well-doing. Um, you tell us if we uh, you know, faint not, we'll reap a harvest in due season. So help my brothers and sisters not to grow weary. Bless those who have tuned in on this Wednesday night to study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's all stand together, if you will. Stretch those legs out after sitting and studying the word for a little while. And let's uh, sing this from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And we will see you this weekend. God bless you.